Good morning, everybody. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, delayed reaction, Professor V. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is really exciting for us, so thank you for joining us here today. Um, this is the first of our Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series for this semester. I'm Leora Lands, um, Assistant Dean of Academics for Shaw School of Hospitality, and proud professor, Associate Professor of the Practice, Chair of our graduate program. Welcome to all the faculty, students, and guests who are here with us today. This is really, really exciting for all of us. Um, and welcome and thank you to our special guest, Ms. Barbara Lynch. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Barbara is chef owner of the Boston-based Barbara Lynch Collective, which is located here in Boston, in the Boston area, with a soon-to-open restaurant called The Rudder in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Before we get started, you know I got to go through some of the housekeeping items just to share a few points and reminders. This talk is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel next week. So please thank you for watching any of the sounds. Um, if we're gonna take notes, use paper and pen, not laptops, please. So please laptops, no clicking, because those sounds actually really do get picked up. And if you could check your cell phones now to put them on to vibrate, please do so. We just want to avoid any of those unnecessary sounds. Uh, for those of you who need to take a scan of a QR code outside for attendance, if you haven't done that yet, absolutely do that after this lecture. We'll give it just another second to, for our guests to get settled in here with seats. Once again, for those of us who can slide down in an extra chair toward the center, please help us do that so we can get everyone comfortable. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Barbara, you're packing them in. This is <laughs> Awesome. Let's get started. Thank you, everybody. Now I'd like to formally share a little bio and intro on our guest, Barbara Lynch. Again, chef owner of the Boston-based Barbara Lynch Collective, Barbara oversees seven celebrated culinary concepts, including Number 9 Park, B&G Oysters, The Butcher Shop, Stir, Drink, Sportello, and Montaume. Her cookbook, Stir, Mixing It Up in the Italian Tradition, received the prestigious Gourmand Award for the Best Chef Cookbook, and she shares her life story through her memoir, Out of Line, A Life Playing with Fire, which was released in April of 2017. And if you haven't started reading this yet, it is one of the most captivating reads <laughs> that I have ever, ever enjoyed. And what a story, Barbara. Wow. wow. Um, Barbara is an American grand chef for Lay and Chateau and has earned two James Beard Foundation Awards as Chef Northeast and Outstanding Restaurateur, as well as an Amelia Earhart Award for her success, success in a male-dominated field. In 2017, Barbara was named to the Time 100, Time Magazine's annual list of the world's most powerful people. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Please join me in a warm welcome to our esteemed guest, Barbara Lynch. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And now I want to hand it off to Dean Arunapneja to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lance. And Barbara, I have to say, it's such an honor and a delight for us to have you here. So welcome to the School of Hospitality at BU. It's such an honor. I'm, um, I'm thrilled, first of all. Thanks for coming out in the tundra weather here. I kind of batten down the hatches, but um, I'm honored. I, I, I love this school. We've had major um, students from this, this program, and they're, they're great and successful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, I've been reading your, your book, um, and I was just fascinated by the description of life that you, when you were growing up, and you're from, you're a Boston native, South Boston, and, you, and, and it's known as Southie. So can you sort of talk about life then at that point, in that place? How was it growing up? How is it different from what it is now? Wow, okay. Um... So I grew up very humble beginnings. Um, Mary Ellen McCormick housing project in South Boston. That's one of three. Um, that's still the oldest housing project in the country, believe it or not. Uh, so my mom, uh, my father died a month before I was born. Um, and so she had seven of us. Um, 
so she worked two jobs. Uh, one was at the St. Patolf Club on Commonwealth Avenue, um, and then she worked at Winthrop Press at night. So I, I barely saw her until I started working uh, at the St. Patolf Club after school. I wasn't as good as students as you are. I cut out every day, and I, I was in the height of forced busing, so my school was just really difficult to go through days sometimes. Um, but I loved the St. Patolf Club, so I started going there when I was 14, and I would make beds, and uh, then I would start waiting on tables around age 15, 16. Um, and I just thought it was fascinating, but I'm an extremely shy person. Uh, so being in the front of the house is really hard for you know, me, but at the club, it was different. It was just, he was a Lescoffier chef, and um, I just learned mostly everything from him. And in my high school, I went to Medicine Park High in Roxbury, and I had a wonderful home ec teacher. And um, she was also a master pastry chef, at the Cambridge School of Culinary Arts. So I would go and take the train from Andrew Square to Cambridge, and I would wash dishes for her so I could get some of the, the, the literature in, in her recipes and so forth. And we're still friends to this day. But she was, uh, she's a major mentor for me. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I know that you know food is intertwined with memories and emotions, and reading your memoir, it seems you're just tuned into the flavors and food experiences. So are there any memories of food growing up in your childhood that sort of stick out in your memory? Everything. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my stepfather, um, actually Stephen's grandfather, he would take us to, do you remember Paragon Park? Anybody know like Nantasket, Hull, Paragon Park? Um, so it was a big day. He'd take a vacation day and he'd take uh, John and my, my younger brother and myself and we'd have to go to the beach all day, mostly. And then you're looking at these roller coaster rides and you just want to play. And then I couldn't wait to get the ferry back to have fried seafood. Like, it was the most amazing, like fried clams, fried calamari. It was just delicious. And I think it's just about the atmosphere, the sun setting. You're going to take this ferry back to South Station. It was a long time ago, but it was brilliant memory. Um, also, just memories of food that I've had that is just makes you feel ethereal or, you know, it, it, when it matches and when it works, it's a, it's, it's a great uh, feeling to have uh, for me. It's, when I read menus, I know exactly what I want. I know I love to see more half bottles of wine and white burgundy and so forth. Um, but when I leave that restaurant, I feel so good um, and that you can remember the dishes you have. I still remember Rabbit Pativier I had in Paris when I first went there. Um, I tried to eat as many really, uh, sorry, uh, Michelin stars or the best restaurants, and I went to lunch every day. That was brutal, but it was <laughs> <laughs> for my husband at the time. He was 26 years older than me. I thought, He's gonna die, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, I fell in love with cooking mostly. I love cooking. I love eating. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not obsessed with food as most. Like I just love the process of cooking and team building and um, teaching mostly too. You know, most of us love eating, so I'm so glad that you love cooking because we can then enjoy. Um, but I want to go back a little bit. And how did you get started in restaurants? And how did you make that transition from restaurants to the kitchen? Yeah. Um, so I guess I wanted to be a chef since I was like 12. So I started talking myself into it, really goofing around with my friends. I mean, I have a gang of 28. We were all... We, always wanted to be older than we were. What do you do? Oh, I'm a chef, you know? So I just started talking myself into that. And then um, after the St. Patolf Club, um, I was working at a warehouse and it was port terminals. And so what it was is I would load 18 trailer, 18 
wheelers with pallets of like jerky spices, McCormick and stuff. So anything that came off of Sealand containers. And I was just like, wow, the world of food is really big. I remember looking at a, a magazine, Good Housekeeping, and my mother had, there was a recipe for um, a stir fry. And I was like, who, who the Christ would do that? That's like so much work. <laughs> and then I couldn't get it out of my mind. So I went and got the, the, the groceries and I, and I did it. And then when I ate it, I was like, oh my God, this is good. So I have to say that cooking for me is like, I love it. Like, it's like a game of hockey for me. Uh, you get crushed for 20 minutes, clean it up, no yelling. You know, it wasn't like that when I first opened, but I think the calmness and if you can create a great atmosphere and a really strong culture back of the house and the front of the house, I find that that's my, maybe it's because of the way I was raised, morals, treat people with respect. And I went through Todd English's kitchen and he's actually the only chef I worked for. So um, after the St. Patolf Club, I ended up taking a job in the, on the vineyard, Martha's Vineyard. And it was like canned chowder, open it up. But he had a wonderful prep area. So I was trying to get him to let me make the chowder and so forth. And he was like, no. You know, he certainly had a food cost he was wanting. <laughs> um, so then I quit that job and he almost killed me. Um, I then started working on a boat. It was a um, 175 foot motor vessel, like uh, the spirit of Boston kind of thing. Um, and then the chef quit like the day before we were gonna go on our first, you know, trip around Falmouth and so forth. And the owner of the boat said, do you think you can do it? And I was like, shit, yes, <laughs> for real. And it was like, oh my God, what did I just do? I rushed to like the library and got as many books as I could to learn how to butcher. Uh, and then I begged for the, there was a restaurant called the Beef Tender so I could learn how to cook beef. And you know, all of that jazz, that was just amazing. So the boat was really just a uh, choice of beef tenderloin or lobster and I mean, the galley kitchen was just tiny, but um, it turned out to be a real success. So, so I got that bite for cooking then, <clears throat> and that was an, a really incredible, successful summer. Fantastic. And then from there, I went to the harvest and um, stayed in touch with my high school teacher and so forth. And then the harvest noticed uh, somebody, I met somebody from, who worked there or at Michaela's in Cambridge, the sous chef at the time and asked me if I would, um, uh, like to interview with Todd English. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then I never did, but he was calling my house and I lived with my mother at the time. Do you want big Barbara or little Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, I finally went there to interview with him, but I was two and a half hours late for the interview because I have severe ADD and dyslexic. So I couldn't figure out for the life of me where this restaurant was. And um, it was on one, it, it was on one Athenaeum Street, which I guess at that time near Polaroid. And it was like before, I guess what, they were gonna put the Kennedy uh, Nassau down there, but then he, you know, got shot. Yeah, sorry. Um, then it went to Houston, but that's how I started. And then um, for Todd, I worked with him for a long time, almost eight years and um, I actually, started that fixed concept, the pizza. So and was, that was a great challenge for me. And it was really the first time I actually got an opportunity to open a restaurant. It wasn't mine, but it was like from beginning to end. Um, it was where Olives was originally in Charlestown. And then he was moving to make it a larger restaurant. And I was to make things happen. And it was great, uh, a lot of fun. and. Jesus, there was a line out the door every night. Four o'clock, people are waiting. I was like throwing up. <laughs> but again, it's that hockey game. If you're organized and and uh, and enjoy it, it it you know you know it's just great. And Todd was a maniac to work for. So if he saw that I had I was too organized, he'd just wipe me out. Oh, I just need these scallions and this and that. So he kept me on my toes all the time. And I think that that's great. I think you can't. I couldn't ask for more than that. I mean, honestly, he was the hardest guy I've ever worked for because of his that craziness, but he was the best guy I ever worked for in terms of learning flavors. 
um, in how he could put dishes together. He was completely, he's completely different than uh, anyone I've ever worked with. A lot of his was just delicious, like, but wasn't technique driven. You know, he'd put onion, celery, carrots in a blender, and I wanted to learn how to brunoise and technique. So, but I stayed uh, mastered Italian, so I love Italian. And then I went to Galleria Italiana, and that's where I got my first award for Food and Wine magazine, um, Best Chef Northeast. Fantastic. And I couldn't believe it because it came in a Federal Express thing, and I threw it out, and I'm almost like, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should look at that. Um, and it said I was awarded that, and um, I was to go to Aspen first trip, and I was making this foie gras uh, raviolis, and when I got to Aspen, the raviolis kind of like uh, broke apart. So we, I had to meet friends and we like other chefs, and they're like, "We got this. We'll get this together." But the best thing was when I did get off the plane. It was before cell phones that. Um, the, you know, when you get a driver and it's like um, Julia Child, Marcella Hazan, Patricia Wells, and I was like, holy shit, Barbara Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, I think it was that um, that made me feel like, wow, maybe this is good for me. I'm good at this. But it wasn't always easy. To, uh, it wasn't. But I think... I think once I got that recognition, um, of course, I, I think I remember Gordon Hammersley calling me and saying, you know, there's only one thing you can do with it. You take it and write it and state a course. And so I was like, I don't know, I'm so nervous. Like, what do I do? And then now seven entities later. So um, food and wine is, it was great. And the James Baird Awards are always that, that great. So uh, that, that when that sign was there and you see all these big chefs, uh, their name, that's public recognition of your talent. But, you know, all, a lot of kids, when we were all growing up, oh, I want to go into Olympics and do this and do that. But at what point did you realize that you actually had, I mean, you, I know you wanted to be a chef right from the get-go, but at what point did you recognize that, yes, I have a talent for this? And, you know, in addition to passion, I have a talent. Was right. it when you were on that boat when you were thrown into the chef? Or at what no. point did you do that? I think it was when I was at Galleria Italiana. Okay. And after, you know, they have a they had a concept, and it was more like a lunch concept, and they it was right on Tremont Street, and um, so they had uh, Emerson College, so they had a good lunch crowd, but they weren't really making the muffins; they were just taking a mix, and, and, um, and they wanted to change, and they wanted to open for dinner, and it was two Italian women from Abruzzi, and so when I quit my job at Gallery uh, at Olives. Um, I went to Gallery Italiana, and um, I just knew that I wanted to maybe get rid of like the decor a little bit, like the fanned out napkins and the china and stuff. So, you know, and they were really great to let me do that, and and the restaurant was great. So, getting those accolades, holding off like Kobe Kramer, really don't review me yet. <laughs> um, but get to know the woman that I'm working with. And it was great. Uh, Zoya made pasta every day. You know, it was fabulous. But then I knew I wanted something else. I, I didn't just want Italian food. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to take on French. So I read, like, Ducasse's books in French and translate them. I mean, it, take, it takes me years to do this stuff. But anyway, that's what I wanted. And I knew from my St. Patolf years how I wanted the service in how I wanted it uh, not to be intimidating. So it was just different from every other entity or restaurant at that time. It was like cool to be the chef owner, but yet, you know, they didn't want to take reservations and stuff. So it wasn't really a properly, you know, run operation. But if you can control the chaos, it's, I think it's a lot better. So that's when I decided to open my own restaurant um, I also feel like the owners of Galleria wanted me to open a restaurant with them. I felt like it's probably not. I don't have partners, so um, so I said no, and then I opened up Number Nine Park, which is still there 25 years later. Right? And she's doing better than ever. Um, and it's right in front of the State House, and 
everyone told me I, I was going to fail because it was a shoe store before or mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. But um, she's still the best. And she's, I mean, it's amazing to have that running. Um, and then I opened up three more in the South End. Um, and they're 18. No, actually, now they're 19 because my daughter's 19 yesterday. So those are 19. And then the three down on Congress Street are about 15. So I've been in it for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, before you opened your own restaurant, where you are obviously the chef owner, you had worked in so many places. How was it like to be a woman working in the kitchen as the chef at that time? Fun. Was it fun? Okay. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, um, I didn't think of it as like I'm a female and those are my, you know, we, uh, I could play just, I could be as tough as anybody. Right. Um, and enough, I have a shield, like, but I also have a heart. And so, um, they, like, they couldn't get away with a lot. You know, some, sometimes when you have a kitchen, you could have a call me who's, who's really mean and comes from like a really male dominated kitchen. And then the girl on Garmage is crying and I'm like, no way. Just fucking hold a mirror up to that person. I'm saying, <laughs> walk away. I don't have time for that. Or I'll see you in the window and my dish will be the best and, and so forth. So I just don't tolerate it. And so it's always about being a little stronger. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there's bullying. I don't know. And it's, it's about how I wanted my atmosphere to feel and how I wanted my staff to feel and how I want them treated. It works. Monica's been with me for 25 years and she's here today. But La Familia. <laughs> and she's, you know, um, but my employees, a lot of my employees, which I have about 400, um, the, the, they've been there for like 20 plus years with me, most of them, um, which that's great. Um, and then when shit hits the fan, it's really hard to kind of find out what's going on um, in terms of leadership and up from the top down, et cetera. So challenges. So uh, you started to talk about the time when they wanted to get into partnership with you, but you opened on your own. So can you talk a little bit more about that time and what made you feel, okay, I want to now put my own restaurant. Were there some things, the way they operated, um, maybe the kitchen, um, or what it is that caused you to say, okay, I want to open my own restaurant now? It was the things they weren't doing right, I guess. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I learned what not to do. Okay. Like to take reservations, to control the chaos, uh, not being mean and brutal. But I also loved the idea of being near Commonwealth Ave, where I spent my, from age 14 to 24, you know. Then in my head, I had a goal that I wanted to open my, open it, my own restaurant by 32, age 32. I have no financial backgrounds, I don't know. <laughs> but... Um, I ended up raising three million dollars. I should read. Should I read it from here? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, it it was um, like I didn't know what to do. I didn't know you could actually have investors and so forth. But it was some of the. I still have them, and um, one is Arnold Hyatt, and he started Stride Right Shoes. Um, there's a lot. David Mugar. Yes, this year. Yeah, yeah. So they're gentlemen, and they saw a kid from the projects, and they wanted to give me a chance. And so I said, yes, for sure. And I wanted to pay them back, and I did in three years. But they're still my, my partners, so 60-40. And then they joined on for the next three, and then they were a little concerned about Congress Street because it was kind of new then. But I don't know where. Anyway, um, It was, it wasn't hard. I think it was just hard to believe that I could actually cook and people are going to like the food. And so, and then it started to feel a little bit more pressure in terms of like general manager, wine selections. But I think I, I grew up in the restaurant, like when I worked at Rocco's, Kat Salieri poached me and she had been my wine director for 25 years. So I've had this like good crew. And so we opened with success. Um, but raising money was um, just having that vision and, 
in, in having a mission and the goals. Like I wanted to be fine dining, but I did not want to be intimidated at all. Like I don't like five forks and spoons. It's just cluttery to me. Uh, so I know when I opened number nine, I think I had the best servers in, in the city and then they quit because they felt like they wanted the forks down and the knives down so they didn't have to go back and remise and then remise again and change the wine glasses. So I noticed that they're the best servers, but I, I don't give a shit. This is my way. <laughs> so I, I said, I'm, I'm going to close the restaurant down for the weekend. There's the door. I reopen Monday and this is the way it goes. So don't, you know, feel free. Don't, you don't have to come back, but this is the way it goes. So I did lose like three of them, four of them, but 10 minutes later, you get people walking in from the four seasons and, and Eli Feldman and I'm very intuitive. And if it's not working for me, it's not going to work at all. So it's not as easy these days, but you know, you want to go through the proper channels, but I had no channels to go through except for, I had a, I had to, I had to pay them back. And um, so that's what I, no one gave me anything growing up. I mean, God, I, I was pretty clever growing up making money, but um, nothing major. <laughs> but, but that's what's so impressive with that uh, background that you have to come into fine dining. And, and you have mentioned Eli Feldman. He's a proud graduate of our school. We are very so proud of him, of all his accomplishments. And, and he used to teach here as well. So. Oh my God, Eli would do everything and anything. He would never say no, and that was really key. And um, I don't know what to read. I, I'm sorry, I had it plugged up. But um, <clears throat> so I, when I did, I talked about the wait staff. I listed guidelines for the wait staff under the heading "My feelings on how to reach four-star service in an unpretentious manner." I hated the "fuck you" attitude of too many fancy restaurants, and also for kitchen behavior. Being a sous chef is like cooking. You want to get the best, you want to get the best work out of people, but to motivate by example rather than intimidate. So I favor a calm, supportive tone. Um, and so it, you got to read this book because there's a lot to talk about. Like the fact that I went to Italy after, oh God, like before I even opened number nine was crazy. I borrowed friends' credit cards. I never like left the country. <laughs> And uh, I was just lucky I made it to Cortona, and that was like just a whole day because I thought when I got to Italy, everything would be in English and nothing, nothing. <laughs> was in English. I thought it'd be like Andrew Square, and I'm like, oh my God. And all the notes I wrote down for my, uh, the girl who worked with me on Gamerge, she, her parents owned a house in Tuscany, so I wrote these notes down like Cusa, but of course, I spelled them my way, so I was totally lost. <laughs> but I finally got there, and I think that opened up my world too. So I, I recommend traveling to, to get a feel for like the culture and the people, and and like Italy is so different than France. France is just there's more men in the kitchens in France, and it's nonas and women in the kitchen in Italy. But you know, it it taught me a lot. It taught me um, a lot, like about technique, dining, but knowing the culture of the people was great. Did that answer your question? Absolutely, absolutely it did. Yeah. Um, I just want to tell you that the students in our school have a lot of opportunity for international travel. Most of them go out for a semester and, and live in another country and some of them are interacting and you saw the room today, they're interacting with kids in other um, students in other countries as well. So. But, but that's a good tip. Well, it's great. It's to... um, so crazy now. You can do it global uh, over Zoom. And yes. like, you know, I can't wait to work with women from Turkey and make pasta with them, these little Montes. And, and then I want to make, I want to cook with Irish grandmothers. <laughs> it's a lot more than cabbage, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so last night I had dinner at Menton and it was absolutely <clears throat> amazing dinner, fabulous food. But you opened Menton in 2008 during the recession. And in fact, you opened three concepts there, Sportello, Drink, and Menton. And at that point, it was still full of warehouses and artist studios. So it was, it was a big risk, it was a big jump there. So um, what made you believe that the, that complex would work at that time and place? Right. Um, 
memories again nostalgic my mother used to walk me like i'd have to go down to downtown crossing so we would walk you know down dart i have two miles take a left but before you took a left you'd look at this building and it used to be old boston costume and as a kid i liked that like you'd see costumes and then fast you know forward 30 years later this developer came to me and asked me if i was interested in any of the buildings down around congress street a street the seaport area and as the soon I, the minute i saw the building on it's like a in congress i, I was like i'll take that Again, I don't know decimal points. I don't know what 15,000 square feet would look like at all, but I said, I'll take the whole place. <laughs> because I had this weird thing about threes. All right, I figured why, I think it was after my trips from Europe. Oh my God, you can get your shoes fixed here, make a reservation, buy flowers. So for some reason, I've had this thing in my head to open in threes. Also, because I felt like it was a little cheaper in construction. So, like, I opened B&G and Butcher Shop at the same time. And they're two corner, two corner spots, which are really hard to find. But the 15,000 square feet was brutal. Um, also, in a recession. So, Montana was, like, a year behind. But if I didn't put three there, I would not have succeeded. You have to create it. You have to create the demand. I mean... Thank God I wasn't on Summer Street, Broad Street. So you want more around you. But I think you really want to be able to work with the communities around you so that you don't like get like chunky dinosaur restaurants or something. But you know, characters, I guess. So um, so fine dining, Benton is obviously fine French fine dining. Um, in Copenhagen, there is this famous restaurant, Noma, that had just closed the doors. And um, a lot of people are concerned that is that signaling the end of fine dining? So no, no, no. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I would say fine dining might the luxury part of four hour dining is probably over, but I don't think fine food is over. Fine dining, great service, super hospitality, and successful like we want to work for a long time. I think that's fine dining. I think. Um, it has to stay around. We have winemakers that are heart and soul, like that that pair with food. So, Renee is good. I mean, I like I like I love him a lot, but um, it's hard. It gets harder and harder for him to create and go foraging and create dishes that are actually. It's a smaller crowd. Okay, I think that his restaurant is avant garde. It's great. I mean, I spoke at the Mad Conference. Um, you know, I think he's just one of those guys who like to push the envelope as well and see what is next for us. And um, did anybody see that movie, um, Menu? That's not the way it goes. <laughs> but um, so, Renee, isn't he going to Japan now? I think. To reopen. It's hard to get to that restaurant, too. You have to like take a boat to get there. So I felt like a lot of that menu, uh, the movie was like, where you have to go to eat at, at Noma. But man, he's successful at all the books and everything. So it's great. So you, you make a very, very good point that fine food is not dead. It's just that whole sit down in four hour, three, four hour, or five hours. So uh, there was a recent article in Boston Globe, which said time change and restaurant should too. So what does that mean for fine dining? And they quoted you in there, and I'm going to read. When Chef Barbara Lynch thinks about opening a restaurant now, she doesn't dream up a new menton, the ambitious prefix restaurant she debuted in 2010 in Fort Point. She looks to the rudder on the water in Gloucester, just a cheerful place Luxury is not going to go away, but in my dream world, I want it to be community driven and accessible and delicious. So, so tell us about the rudder, the new restaurant that you're opening in Gloucester. Okay, so I guess so the rudder gives me this opportunity to re recalculate all the others. So I, I have seven year leases in Boston, so I'm not going anywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I need to recalculate um, because I feel like, again, this is internal, okay? And you start to look at what the hell's going on, why are 
why is this general manager leaving, this one leaving, and because that's a failure. If somebody quits on me, that's, I'm a failure. Um, so I don't want that to happen. Um, what did you, there's another. So, um, I, oh, the rudder, the rudder is, yeah. 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 That's about the so I'm, in, I'm, ta I'm taking out third parties, okay? Uh, Squarespace, open table, toast. It's gonna be handwritten dupes, hours 12 to 2.30. Uh, then we reopen six to nine. Um, so it's it's like a, an incredible. Think about I don't know. It's not prune yonky. It's going to be a beautiful bowl of pasta. Uh, it's going to be gorgeous soups, and I can have this opportunity now to start old school, have a maitre d, have a bookkeeper, that so that the management can get out earlier. Then because if you're closing the restaurant, restocking, and all that, but and then the count outs and money bookkeeper all around. So it's about changing. Uh, I find a lot of my, uh, especially after COVID, I mean, I've seen so much, I had to go back in and um, I learned a lot. And I learned a lot that complacency is, is a killer in the restaurant industry. So if you're depending on open table and, and you actually don't know how to work the guest center and all of that, you're killing me because they'll go right next door. So that's a lot of management to manage and to pay for it. And seven entities and have a reservationist. So I'm not saying this is going to work by any means, but you know, I use toast at the end of the night. You know, I wake up in the morning going, wow, am I going to need like a time clock? I don't know, you know, because I really want them to be in, in, in with me, um, placing the order. Talk to me about the allergies. I want a soigne slip on everybody. Um, and then I say, once that goes down, just think in your head, seven minutes, clear it. Seven minutes for the next one, clear it. So that we are getting two turns in two hours. Uh, three turns in two hours. So that formula kind of works for me. And I love contact. I love communication in the kitchen. Um, I don't like not having the computer. I don't like it. I trust me. I was on the board of open table. It'll kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I took Danny Myers, thought that it for me, if I want to succeed and I'm setting myself up for success after COVID, if we have another pandemic, um, rent increases, uh, like it's always um, over saying it's hard to find employees. So what I did notice in my company is that we're not teaching enough. So I inspire by giving books, inviting the chefs to my house, just read, I'll drop stuff off. But I think in terms of like, it takes teamwork in those computers, they're just, they're just not working for me. I'm sorry, I, I, I know it's good, but don't get me wrong, I wanna start a vending machine company for sure. I just feel like if you took my numbers and you would say, Squarespace, seven chefs, you know what I mean? It's just too much. It's just too much for seven entities. So I'm, I'm trying to do this, tweak this. First time I'm designing the restaurant myself. Uh, first time I ever took a restaurant over, which I'll never do it again. I usually like a box and then I can create that box. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it. Any of you want to be chefs and restaurant owners? Or, yeah? Cool. Where? Nice. It's a lot. That's great. You'll do it. <laughs> Just talk yourself into it. So three tons in two hours versus one ton we had last night. So that was that is a big change. So you're changing the whole concept. Fine food, but you know, faster turnover. But Barbara, all your restaurants are in Boston. Now, first time you go to Gloucester. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting too. Huh? Yeah. <sighs> Uh, so I've been dormant for 15 years. I opened eight restaurants in like, I don't know, 10 years. Um, and so this one is, I lived, I moved to Gloucester after I, I wrote the memoir, uh, because I was living in South Sea and I was still like living next to the state trooper who grew up with me. And I'm like, I don't know, I gotta go. I gotta get out of here. It was too close to all the restaurants. <laughs> And um, I found a house in the Sunday Globe. The next day I went to Gloucester and I bought it. I was like, I need this house. And so, so I've been living in sort of Lanesville for a, a eight years. 
but I'm on five acres surrounded by 27 acres. And nobody comes up there at all to visit or, I mean, they do to visit, but you don't have what I have down in Rocky Neck. And um, it's an iconic bar. It's been owned by, it was owned for 50 years by a, a woman named Evie Parsons. And her two daughters worked for her. And that restaurant was iconic, a fun environment, um, hearty, but yet it was supposedly the best food in, in Gloucester at the time. So then she passed away, they ended up selling it. And then it went downhill and it has been closed for six years. So, um, and we're literally on the water. Like when the tide comes in, cake tide, I got flooded. And so it's been a, like a headache, um, larger than I wanted. I'm a year behind. So, and I don't own it. I used to own. Um, so there's a question. I don't know. But the letter is going to be great. Yeah. Can wait for it to open. I hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to talk about something. It's kind of work. Who <laughs> cares? <laughs> so um, you know, one of the constant themes I've observed, you know, in, in, is that, that you were Italian. You went to Italy and you learned, and then you went and learned French um, cooking, and you went to France. Um, and now you recently you have been painting a lot. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I did. I um, I self, uh, I'm still learning. I I paint uh, food uh, mostly. No, I don't know what I paint. Do you? Follow on Instagram. I love painting. I, I paint when I'm stressed. I'm, I mean, there's something about being able to paint for two or three hours, whether it's, you know, oil's a little bit more productive, like, pff, I like, I love oil, but it takes more time to set it up, let it dry. So I, I paint um, lots of stuff. Um, but I also draw food for chefs. So if I'm traveling and they're ahead of me uh, by a day or two, then here, this is what I want the plate to look like. It could be squab or something like that. I don't know. But they'll get it. Like, this is how I want it plated. And um, so that's been fun, too. So I'm going to do another book, but a lot of it is with art, too. Fantastic. Um, so um, at this stage in life, you've had tasted tremendous success in so many different ventures. And now you're opening Rudder. Um, what is, and now painting. So that is uh, very, very motivating that you're continuously learning all your life. So what do you think life has in store for the next few years? Um, I feel like the next few years is for me is branding and uh, uh, making what I, so I've had these goals, I've had goals for 15 years about, I, <clears throat> I have a foundation that's been uh, quiet since COVID. So I want to bring that back, the Barbara Lynch Foundation. It was too small, it was too narrow just for cooking. I love entrepreneurial, I love it. I love teaching, I used to call them passion trips. So I'd go to South High or East High for, for this program that I had called Meet the Worms. And um, it was great. Like we, the science classes were um, about a thousand worms and we had to separate what goes into compost and, you know, and part of math and science. So that was fun and to see kids who grow up in, like projects we have never seen a real tomato or potato. It's important to me that kids get to cook. Not only kids, it's, it's parents. It's, you know, we're busy and how do we make it work? And I also started a food product and I want to get that up and running. So I think for me, I think it's timing is everything. And the switch is sort of like this silver lining that says, all right, go, you know? And um, so the water was a big push for that. Then we can start branding. I don't know, clothes, I could sell artwork. I don't sell it now, so I don't, I don't know. The future's in my vending machine ideas, so. <laughs> I, uh, you know, the world is great right now in terms of food and science, you know, beverage programs, everything's changing. I, I see chefs coming up with like their own pots and pans these days and like, and like David Chang, I love his noodles, you know? So I don't know, but it's, um, I want to have these takeout meals and this, this product I started is one of the healthiest products on the market, but I bought the URL to IHateHoodFoods.com. So I don't want them to buy it and put the name of something else, but it's a dehydrated vegetables, uh, that I created because I, uh, 
first of all, my daughter got sick and in the hospital and vending machines, you could only get Snicker bars, shit food. And I was just like, oh my God, what is, what is this? And so that's always been on my mind. But um, the health food is all you do is boil water and bring it back. It's the safest way for, uh, there's no botulism, you're taking the water out. The only difference is you cannot um, cook it because there's no water in it, it would just fry. But you boil water and you can throw in carrots, parsnips, turnips, beets. Uh, the, the product is great. It's, I just have to get it going. And I bought a dehydrator in Serbia. It's like the size of a football field, but it's solar operated. Um, that's stored in Rhode Island right now. But I also found a vegetable company in Vacaville, California. So a big on all citrus first and then parsley, tomato. And so literally, if you had no food in your cabinets, you could open up those mushrooms and, you know, I mean, I, I have a picture. I just don't know how to show you. It's great. It's called, it's called made. Also, what frustrates me makes me create things. Uh, why, why am I paying for stems on tomatoes and these sticker things? And yes, I know that's your inventory system, but it's pain in the ass. And like you, you do travel Europe, and when you go to the markets, they give you herbs and stuff. But like, what do you do? I'm not saying me, but other people. What do you do? And if you have a whole head of parsley and these herbs, it's just that's. I want to make it easier. <clears throat> And it would feed a family of four for like nine dollars for a couple of weeks or you know not a couple of days but it's a great product so i'm working on that too and i think once i get the rudder up and running then all my other things i wanted to work on will start to come to play also creating a mind lab up there in gloucester as well so that we something similar like to creating things i'd love to work with your students sometime to create things like just to make things better more accessible, more healthier. I mean, I can't find healthy food. I can't find great food that I love in, in fast food restaurants right now. I just can't. So that's what I mean about bistro style, trattoria, maybe that's coming, but still we're gonna have tablecloths. And it's just gonna get harder and harder to have great silver china glassware silverware. It just goes up and up and up and it's never gonna go down, I feel like. And every chef I know wants to buy buildings. I would not do that. I couldn't do it. I'm not a landlord. And uh, listen, when 15,000 square feet and the drink gets flooded and the handicapped elevator goes down, I'm glad I'm not that landlord. Because um, it's a lot of money to be a landlord. But I know it's better to have a piece of property too. Right. So, um, Barbara, I want to ask you about, so you, you mentioned that you, um, b before the thing you were mentioning that you like to um, have your employees stay with you for a long time and you want to help them grow. Um, but I'm sure you've seen a lot of some turnover in your 25 years of operating restaurants. Mm. And so there is a, a change in this generation of students that are coming in. Uh, they want more work-life balance. They want more positive work culture. and so. So what, what are the kinds of things you've noticed over the last few decades of being in the kinds of you know, work culture that people want? Everybody wants work balance, of course. Um, okay. I find that if we go this route in terms of closing from 2.30 to 6, get them out by 9, get them out by 10. I mean, a lot of my employees don't have cars, and so they'll have to take the T, or they'll have, they all live, like, live in Revere and Chelsea, and they all get on a bus together. I mean, I, like, I want to create opportunities so that they can open whatever they want, and, but I want to help them. I want to invest in them, show them locations that would be killer, um, and get them on their way. Um, another thing that frustrates me is, like, the highways. Why are we just stuck with Subway and McDonald's and all of that when you could have a B and g lobsters and, or a great cup of coffee instead of Dunkin's? So, it's about pushing those envelopes and seeing where we go from there. I mean, you know, one pot wonder dishes, like a big delicious soup. I mean, imagine, or roast chicken on the road. God, it'd be great. But it takes village. It takes like, so I'm just pushing the buttons. I don't know if I'll get there, <laughs> but it's a dream, you know? And so to have the staff, they're loyal and they deserve it. Um, much like, like, they're hard workers and they're extremely passionate. 
a lot of them might not want to open restaurants and they like to be working in a consistent atmosphere with delicious food and happy customers and then they return and they have homes and families and so I love that too but I also want to be there for this next generation to help them get to where I kind of am less like how did I get from point A to point B with zero education I don't know man but I I do see I guess I'm not angry person but things do get me get me a little going to say it's got to get better there's got to be more so Barbara, your story is so inspirational. You came up from those projects and you've achieved so much success. What advice would you have for students that are now entering the workforce and, and you know, trying to take, you know, taste uh, success? Um, be cautious of where you go. I don't know if, if you're in the restaurant world or in the food and beverage world, make sure you find a place that you're, you like, uh, you love the cuisine, you, you, you like the teamwork, um, because you want to feel good. Okay. So look for that first. Um, I find lately everyone's looking for money. Uh, like, like a, a, a chef wants $95,000 in a, in a 40 seat restaurant in Gloucester. <laughs> then another, and then what about parking, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, I never had that growing up. I mean, that when I was working, I didn't, I had to get to work. So I think work-life balance is definitely a big change for everybody. Uh, if you're going to stay the course, don't jump around from restaurants or companies, I guess. But these days you can start working together to accomplish lots of things, whether it's food products, um, you know, stuff like that. So you have more opportunity, but I would say pick one, stay with it until you feel you haven't learned anymore. Um, and then, and then make sure you talk to somebody or move on. But, um, for me, my friends always lifted me up and I, they weren't like the friends I grew up with were just crazy, but they were always supportive. But the people I surrounded myself with, I mean, I talked about food all the time growing up. I was like, oh, brother, you know, but I was obsessed with it and I love cooking. So, you know, you're going to love it. Whatever you do or where you're going, make sure you love it. And don't let anybody change your mind either. My vision's my vision and this is what I want. And it's not easy, but stay the course, stay, keep the vision because it's better it's it's a better way to work with people because it has to come from somewhere it can't from my vision doesn't come from a computer it comes from here and then and then we drive it from there what are the missions i mean god i have so many so it's hard for me to always write a mission statement <laughs> i'm like <laughs> but i think i think it's a great opportunity to be in the industry in the hospitality industry in general because we are in lack of hospitality with computers and so forth. So I can't wait to see what you guys do and stay healthy and stay warm, you know, today, but. <laughs> <laughs> so single minded pursuit, hard work and passion, learning. First. passion, passion and learning that that is just so interesting. It has come through again and again during the conversation today. Uh, make sure that you're learning your passion, hard work. I look for passion. I, I'm not a big, uh, you know, a fan of shitty management. So, you know, I, I'd rather not have to waste time on bad management to get to my management. So if you show passion and you have it, you're going to, you're going to win. You got to do things you love, right? You can always change. I mean, it doesn't matter. You get onto something else, but at least you have this repertoire started of what you like. And I wish you all the best. So Barbara, I have some fun questions to ask you. Now you're Barbara Lynch and you have all these fancy restaurants. Um, do you have comfort food or are you eating gourmet food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, day after day? You want to see what's in my bag? <laughs> <laughs> Peter Bear and jelly sandwich on okay. Wonder Bread from yesterday that I ate <laughs> this morning for breakfast. I mean, literally I can eat tuna fish every day. Um, I could eat what I made for dinner in the morning. I, I just need to have snacks all day. And especially if I'm writing recipes, I just get hungry and I'm like, oh, so I'm not a fancy eater. I don't cook for me. 
um, I cook for my customers, so I get to know who they are, and you know, I, things that you don't cook at home, like sweet breads and pheasants and squabs. Those are my favorites. But I know a person doesn't really cook that at home, right? So you have that with great burgundy and call it a day. I mean, that to me is fun cooking. Did I answer your question? Absolutely, 100%. I think everyone enjoyed listening to you eating peanut butter jelly sandwich. Um, it's a bad. <laughs> I have the worst refrigerator too at home. It's it's never been like it's been a freezer. So it's kind of cool because then I can eat soup, but I leave a fork in it. Like whatever. I, I'm a very simple person. English muffins. I do like Bagel World. It's my new thing right now. <laughs> it's a good bagel. I'm sure you guys have it. Maybe here. we'll have Barbara Lynch bagels. Who knows? No. <laughs> no. But I do, you know, I eat normal food. Fantastic. What do you guys, what do you eat? Uh, I eat, in, you know, number nine power at Mentor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the, do you, you're doing so many things, painting and running all of these restaurants. Do you have time for TV? Do you occasionally watch? So movies or TV? What are the favorites? What the beauty you? is I work. Uh, I work from my. I work from my home. Okay. So I do have the TV on. I'm usually the Today Show, and then I know like ten o'clock is like I gotta get in the shower. But then I do leave. I've been watching a lot of documentaries like lately. Um, my hero, Elaine Ducasse. Did you see that? Uh, Jeremiah Tower, Joel Rubichon. Oat, uh, oat cuisine, a female chef who, who cooked for the president of France. That was an interesting one. And then I saw a menu and I was like, oh my God, I'm still disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started to watch beer. Um, and I typically don't watch cooking shows, um, but I think I'm starting to get to that nervous point. Oh my God, I got to open in 15 weeks. So, you know, it's just a refresher course, but um, Watching my heroes and my mentors on television, because I'm basically self-taught through their books, so they are my carrot. That's what I wanted to be. Dugas has how many Michelin star restaurants? Like 18, maybe more? Then you know he doesn't cook because he was in a car accident, I mean a plane accident. He was the only survivor, so I find him amazing in ways how he delegates and he's so organized and he has the respect of his teams. And so I'd like to get there. That's, that's another goal. Fantastic. I think, yeah. Barbara, it has been an absolute delight talking to you. Thank you so much for spending. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. I'm going to turn it back to Professor Lanz. Okay. I'm starting podcasts too. <laughs> Boy, I'm new for me. Who else is ridiculously inspired by listening to the creative, the creativity that just continues to flow? I mean, Barbara, oh my God, the Renaissance woman, just amazing to listen to. Looks like I'm a hundred. No, it's, you've got the hundred ideas going on in your mind, but not not age at all. And I was going to share that. Where's our entrepreneurship and professor? He's in this room right now. Barry's back there. We got to get you in our branding class. We're going to help you with branding. I can tell you that right now. We want to be involved with that. We're going to get done, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, take notes. Take notes. Um, and I'll tell you, Barbara, your ad, your determination to keep people happy and your passion for people and your sense of place because that's one thing that came out of we had a quick conversation about that last night it's just mm. really amazing and sense of community and you're right that's what's lost in hospitality so thank yeah. you for preserving that thank you i think thank you i mean community is your key it's key and i love boston it's not always easy going through another political change and so forth um but your community will support you. And I love it when, oh my God, a disaster happens, but your restaurant is open and people want to be there. And that's a good sign. Well, it's testament to you Thank with you. all the loyalty. I just want to share a couple of other housekeeping notes before we wrap this up for today. Um, there is going to be a reception immediately following this with Barbara and Dean of Naja. <clears throat> for anybody who's bought the book, and if you haven't, go right next door and go get it quick. Get online. Um, but bring the book with you, Barbara. We'll happily sign them. And Barbara, thanks for that. Thank I'm, I'm, it's on audio, too. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you for being here today, everybody. Um, we're our next and our second 
Dean's Distinguished Series for the semester is actually a week from today with Amas Fakhani, who happens to be the chair of the Board of Trustees of Boston University. And he's also the founder and CEO of the restaurant, restaurant hospitality firm, the Alta Morea Group in New York. So please mark your calendars and come back for that. So that's going to be wonderful. And don't I'm forget our Hospitality yeah. Leadership Summit, March 24th. You know how that is. That's our, our number one amazing, amazing, successful event. So please come to that. Last round of report applause for Barbara today. Oh, thank you.